Okay, now we're going to look at a simple version of a object recognition model. We uh, scaled this model down so that it's easy to run on your laptops. There are larger scale versions of this that work on real images and real objects. Uh, but for this purpose, we're going to just be looking at these simple kind of uh, shapes. These are kind of letter-like shapes. They're composed of these kind of, we think of them as LED stimuli. Uh, old-fashioned light-emitting diode displays have this kind of characteristic that they make different combinations of horizontal and vertical lines again, uh, our favorite kind of stimuli. And you can see that there are some letters here like an F, uh, there's an H, uh, but then there's also these other ones that, you know, backwards F, whatever, rotated F, uh, these other funny characters. And so we just have actually all possible combinations of three lines represented here. Um, and what this also allows us to do is leave out two of these objects. So we're going to take these two objects here, the U, which is 18, and this kind of double teeth uh, stimulus, which is 19. And uh, we're going to not train the network on those. And then we're going to later test it on its ability to recognize those objects. And that turns out to be really important for establishing how systematic the network is in learning what it's learning so that it can generalize that knowledge to new objects and isn't just kind of memorizing uh, the individual objects that it's been trained on. Okay, so here's our network. Uh, you can see V1, V4, IT output. We don't have a V2. Uh, it's such a small scale model that we don't need one. Again, larger versions of this model are available that do actually have these uh, V2 and actually have the two layers of IT. So this is, a, this is again just a kind of simplified version for the, for the textbook demonstration. Now we're going to look at how an individual stimulus is processed by the network. Uh, just as you would expect, you get some visual input. This is looking at a particular image. In this case, these three vertical lines is the stimulus that was randomly generated. And these stimuli are generated at different sizes, locations, introducing these random variations in the input similarity structure that the network has to learn to overcome. So anyway, this is the particular stimulus. We're filtering through this through uh, simple oriented edge detectors, Gabor filters, like we saw from V1. And so this is the result of all those Gabor filters. In addition, uh, as we saw in the earlier diagram, it has the on has the edge stop cells and the length summing cells. So this complex pattern, you can kind of see these, these vertical lines here, but it also has a, a bit more complexity and richness to the input encoding. And that's just simply fixed. It's very efficient to implement that directly. It saves uh, having to have the network learn that, um, and it's a reasonable approximation to what we think the network does learn. And then it drives activity up here, Again, this is all the classic kind of conductance-based uh, excitatory input that we're getting, driving activity up there in the V4 layer. Um, there's inhibitory competition um, that resolves. You get this pattern of activity. It goes up into infratemporal cortex, um, and then finally up into the output layer. And uh, often, you don't get the output layer activated very early in training because the patterns are so un under recognized. We are presenting the plus phase output, as you can see here. Um, so this is the correct uh, name or label or you know identifier for this particular output pattern. And so it's just the classic kind of minus phase plus phase as if this was kind of a name that we were hearing uh, for this particular uh, input pattern. And so the network just proceeds to the next input patterns. Um, and you see we get a minus phase followed by a plus phase. That difference between those two uh, phases is shown here with this act diff. That is the delta error signal. And so we're essentially effectively, as we described in chapter four, back propagating this error signal uh, from this output layer into these earlier layers and that back propagated signal is able to train even these very early V4 representations to do a better job of recognizing features that will support uh, good recognition of the objects at the output layer. So this is really also a very important demonstration of why backprop is so important because you need to adjust these earlier lower level representations 
to support this overall objective of learning the right category names at the higher level. And if you just had these individual neurons learning you know, locally as they wanted to without caring about the output, they may not learn the right kind of features. And that's, again, another reason why heavy in learning, which is purely local, doesn't do a good job at these kind of tasks and why you need error-driven learning. We can hit train, it'll keep running. Um, we've got it settling so you can kind of see these two different activity states. Um, if we click over here on image, you can see kind of matrix style, the whole set of images, and you can see the amount of uh, translation that these things are sh kind of shifting on different parts of the image. There is a kind of border around the edges that we uh, don't present to the network, so it's, it's still kind of shifting within a, re a region here. They're also being scaled at different sizes, and the network just continues to train. A faster mode of updating, and you get a doo -doo 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 -doo. so that's the shifting between the minus phase, plus phase. Uh, network is, is much faster than um, our uh, kind of real time here. Uh, so we get kind of an accelerated period of learning, and you can already see when we look at the percent error curve that uh, learning is proceeding relatively rapidly. Um, and the network, as it goes down, is already getting about 80% correct, 20% uh, errors after six to seven, eight epochs or so. So uh, very quick learning. Again, this is a small scale problem. We've only got 18 different objects that we're recognizing. Uh, and uh, so it should be able to learn this relatively quickly. And here we've loaded in the final uh, training graph for the network as it learned over a period of 50 epochs or iterations through those training set items. Um, and you can see that it got nearly perfectly uh, good performance at the end there. Okay, now we can see the flow of activity in a network with trained synaptic weights as it activates in a feed forward way up here to V4 and then IT. And we can see relatively quickly, we get activation of a particular output unit here. And as we let the network settle going forward, we can see that that is in fact the correct uh, output label. The plus phase is the same. There's very small differences you can't really see between the minus phase and the plus phase, and the network has basically learned to recognize these objects as we could see from the overall training graph.